We got to dive. We got to dive deep. If you have your Bible, turn to Acts 9. Acts chapter 9. Um, Last week was Celebration Sunday. If you were not here, go back and listen to the testimonies. It was amazing. I think we had like 42 minutes straight of testimonies. Um, We had 12 baptisms. It was an amazing service. The week before that, I talked about divine communion. And if you've not listened to that message, I want to encourage you to listen to that message. Because what I'm going to do this morning is divine communion is that the greatest call as a believer is to walk with God. It's to walk with God. And did you know that the greatest desire of God's heart is to walk with you? And so what I want to do this morning is I want to kind of springboard off that and I want to talk about What does it look like then to walk with God and specifically talk about one aspect of that, which is walking in the fear of the Lord? Walking in the fear of the Lord. So Acts 9. Most of you know the story of Acts 9. We we talk about it uh, probably in different different contexts, but Acts 9 is the conversion of Saul. All right, so we have Saul is... Like when we're talking about the pinnacle of Christian persecution in this time, the top of the totem pole is Saul. Okay, Saul is, if you were a believer at the time, Saul is probably like your least favorite person. He's probably the one that you're like, Lord, can I really bless this person in my prayer time? You know, can I, uh, it's like he was persecuting believers at the time. And Saul is one of the most least likely people that we would say, Lord, you know, that that we would think God would use to then write most of the New Testament. Look what God did. So you have this man who's persecuting believers. Acts 9, we start. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest and he asked for letters so that he can take anybody belonging to the way, which is what the believers were called at this time. And then what happens in verse three? Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Can you imagine? Can you see this moment? He's walking on the road. He's thinking, man, I'm I'm going to persecute more Christians. And all of a sudden, a light flashes, and he can't see probably, and um, Jesus encounters Saul on the road. So when we talk about encountering Jesus... This is an encounter with Jesus. This isn't just words. This is Jesus shows up on the scene and said, I am the one that you are persecuting. And so Saul has this encounter. It changes everything. And so he then gets led to Damascus. He loses his eyesight. Ananias doesn't really want to pray for Saul, (laughs) right? I'd be there. Can we be honest? Lord, why? Why do I need to pray for this man? Because the Lord was changing something. The Lord was, in, was doing something. And so Ananias prays for him. He regains his sight. Um, the Lord tells Ananias, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the son of Israel. And then he says one of the most profound statements that probably none of us would want to be said, which is, oh, and by the way, he's going to suffer for my name's sake. How many are signed up for that? Guess what? As a believer of Jesus, you're signed up. You're signed up to suffer for his name's sake. That's not a popular YouTube message, I know. But that's the reality of the gospel. If you bear his name, there's going to be trial, there's going to be persecution, there's going to be suffering, there's going to be a lot of people that don't like you. But you know what? It's worth it to bear his name. So what happens? What happens? I love this. Now for several days, we're in um, 
the end of 19 here. Now, for several days, he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. What happens? Several days have elapsed since his encounter. And what does Paul do? What does Saul do? Immediately begins to proclaim Jesus. He didn't have a PhD yet. He hadn't been to ministry school yet. I don't know how many church services he'd been in yet. And what happens? He sees Jesus and he goes, I can't just keep this to myself. I must proclaim. Immediately he begins to proclaim Jesus. So you encounter Jesus. You become an instrument of encounter. Cities are transformed. That's how. It's when we get him so, we're so after him that we're like, I have to proclaim. I have to immediately begin to preach Jesus. Now, what happens? The Jews don't like this. The plot became known to Saul. So they had a plot to try to take him. Barnabas took hold of him, brings him in. And we have him moving it says here we are in verse 28 he was with them moving about freely in jerusalem speaking out boldly in the name of the lord now i want to skip real quick if you can skip with me to verse 31 so this is the context of verse 31 verse 31 says so the church throughout all judea and galilee and samaria enjoyed peace being built up and going on in the fear of the lord and in the comfort of the holy spirit it continued to increase So I wanted to provide some quick context for you so you had a grid for this because Saul encounters Jesus. He becomes an instrument of encounter. And literally in verse 31, we find out that because of this encounter from this one person, it says that they enjoy peace. What can one encounter with Jesus and one person meeting Jesus, could it bring peace to all of Fort Worth? Could it bring peace to Dallas? Could it bring peace to Plano? Could it bring peace to Washington, D.C.? I'm not talking about thousands of people. It's easy to get lost in numbers and stadium gatherings. What about one person? What about a Saul that's on the road, sees Jesus, life trajectory changes, and now his mission becomes immediately proclaiming Jesus and literally, literal cities were transformed because there was peace when before there was chaos. Because one man, there's a 180 because that's what the Lord does. He takes somebody who's stuck. He takes somebody who's persecuting him. He takes somebody who maybe he might be the most against Jesus right now and when they encounter him their life changes and the person that most hated Jesus becomes the person that most loves him and things change who is the Saul next to you at Walmart that the Lord wants you to proclaim the gospel to to see peace happen in changing a city All right. So what I want to talk about today is I want to really hit on the fear of the Lord. Okay? I want you to see the church kept increasing, not because they had it all together, but because they walked in the fear of the Lord and the consolation, exhortation, or strengthening of the Holy Spirit. All right, what is the fear of the Lord? Does anybody know what the fear of the Lord is? The beginning of wisdom. Okay, anybody else? Reverence, awe, shun evil. It's good. You're all right. The fear of the Lord is used 19 times just in the book of Proverbs. The exact phrase, the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 8.13 says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, arrogance, and the evil way, and the perverted mouth I hate. 
Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Proverbs 14.26, if you want confidence, it says, In the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life by which one may avoid the snares of death. In 2 Chronicles 19.7, it says, Now then, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be careful about what you do, for the Lord our God will have no part in injustice or partiality or in the taking of a bribe. bribe. David, in Psalm 19.9, he says, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. So from these passages, we find aspects of the fear of the Lord. I'm going to skip here. Aspects of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord does not look like evil, pride, or arrogance. So if you're walking in the fear of the Lord, evil, pride, and arrogance are not to be part of it. Okay, the fear of the Lord isn't just wisdom. It would have been one thing for Solomon to say, the fear of the Lord is wisdom. He says it's the beginning. What's the point? You can't have godly wisdom without the fear of the Lord. It's the beginning place of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is confidence. The fear of the Lord is life that leads you away from death. It is clean. That word clean means pure. It's pure. And it brings increase. We see that in Acts 9.31. The church increased. The fear of the Lord actually brings increase. The person that fears the Lord isn't interested in the ways of the world. They want to be obedient and follow his way to the extent that everything else isn't an option. The fear of the Lord is what sets you apart. And the reason I'm talking about this this morning is because I believe that the fear of the Lord is one of the most needed things in our hour. I think we can talk about a lot of things that, that, that are good, but I think at the end of the day, it's the f- person who fears the Lord is so, is so set apart for him that everything else in the world that the world might bring just is no longer an option because we fear him. But the fear of the Lord is not the spirit of fear. It's not a spirit of fear that we cast out. It's I fear the Lord. It's reverence. It's awe. It's a sense of um, wanting to make every decision that I can make from the place of what is God doing. So what we see in the book of Acts is the church grew Because of the fear of the Lord. And I just believe my personal conviction is that if you get this message, there are going to be things that are going to come at you that you're not going to want to participate in because you're like, I walk in the fear of the Lord. All right, let's keep going. We got to keep going. The person who is afraid of the Lord runs from the presence of God. The person who fears the Lord has nothing to hide and is more terrified of being away from God. The fear of the Lord draws you deeper into him, not further away. It's deeper into him. It's not further away. So the person, we just said this, is not interested in the ways of the world. Um, There's a great resource, and his name is, I don't know how many of you know John, John Bevere. Uh, He's written a lot of great books. One of them is The Awe of God. That's a newer book. Uh, But he wrote a book, I believe, even back in the 90s called The Fear of God. Um, Some of my notes that I'm about to read come from John Bevere's teaching. So I just want to give him props and credit where that's due. So here's what he says, fearing the Lord. He says, if you fear the Lord, you will obey God instantly. You will obey God when it doesn't make sense. You will obey God even when it hurts. You will obey God even if you don't see a benefit. When you fear the Lord, the person that fears the Lord, you don't have to convince them of the benefits of obeying God. You don't have to write down, hey, here's all the things you might get 10 years from now if you do this now. The person who fears the Lord is just about, it's about focusing on him, not on an outcome. 
Listen, he promises to bless you, but the focus of the one who fears him isn't on the outcome, but the person. We can't have outcome-based Christianity. It leads to a lot of burnout. There's a lot of believers that are burned out in the faith because they were brought in with this slot machine style Christianity and it's not, re- it's, not, it's not real. It's not the word. It's not God. God is like, look at me and I will do things, but the point isn't the things. The point is me. All right. Psalm 25 verse 14. The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him. That word secret means intimacy. The intimate, we talked about divine communion, the intimate walking with the Lord as we know that his greatest desire is to walk with us and then our greatest call is to walk with him. As we walk that out, that looks like walking in the fear of the Lord. All right, if you fear God, you love what he loves and you hate what he hates. All throughout the book of Acts, you see the apostles making decisions based on following the Lord, not man. To the extent that Peter and John in Acts 4 literally tell them, if you want to do that, that's fine. But as for us, we follow the Lord, not you. We don't follow you, though. What did Daniel do when he was faced with having to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar? Sorry, but you're not really my king. God is. I cannot bow to an earthly man that would seek to do things differently than I see God doing. So I'm going to focus on God and be willing to die or whatever the consequence may be. I cannot bow to you. I have to bow to God. The fear of God calls you out of yourself and into him. It provokes your heart in every area. His fear is what provokes you to holiness. His fear is what establishes you, sustains you, and his fear is what sets you apart. The fear of the Lord is that my covenant with the Lord, friendship, intimacy, and obedience to his word is more important than anything else in my life. But here's one thing we have to understand when we talk about the fear of the Lord is the fear of the Lord is connected to your view of God. And I just want to spend a few minutes, and I just kind of want to pop a little bit of a bubble if I can do that. Our view of God has to be congruent, not with one scripture, with the whole Bible. Your view of God has to be congruent with all of this, not just the ones you like. Okay, It has to be congruent with who we see his nature and character to be. And so what do we see? God is love. That's 1 John 4, 8. God is what? Full of mercy and grace. Thank the Lord, right? God is compassionate and slow to anger. God is kind. We find Romans 2, 4. That's the verse that says his kindness leads you to repentance. God is good. Thank the Lord, right? The goodness of God. God is faithful. That's Deuteronomy. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 3.3. Do we know this about God? Okay, so when we talk about the fear of the Lord, we have to talk about it within the context of his nature and his character. All right, so this is who he is. But who is God also? He's just. He's a judge. He's a jealous God. He's mighty. He's a warrior. The Bible even talks about him being the righteous judge. It says he sits on a throne of justice and righteousness, right? So here's the deal. We have to have 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 both of these aspects of God. I think a lot of times we like, we love this list, and we're not a huge fan of this list all the time. Wait, you mean he you mean he cares about injustice? Wait, well, hold on, hold on. You mean he hates wickedness? Whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on. You mean mean I'm going to give an account for my life at the end of my days? Hold on, you mean he cares cares about the state of my heart? You mean he cares about the decisions I make? You mean he cares about the choices I make? And, and, And sometimes we have this version of God where we love this list, but we don't like this list because now we can't just do whatever we want. 
Because that's the fear of the Lord. Is this making sense? Okay. I felt like I needed to go here this morning. This is a little bit, this is not going to be a popular, popular reel on Instagram, but it's all good. Sometimes I think what happens, and I feel this sometimes in our culture, is that we only say that God is the attributes on the first list. But when people start talking about him being a judge and just and one who hates evil, we start to not like that God anymore. You mean God doesn't love all of the decisions that I make? Yeah, he loves you. But he doesn't love you participating in wickedness. He desires to draw you into his heart And out of that place, this is what grace is, guys. What is grace? The empowering presence of God to draw you into him, not away from him. So grace is deeper into him. So we have this walking in the fear of the Lord is I'm drawing deeper into the Lord, which means I'm inevitably drawing deeper away from all of these things that don't satisfy I'm drawing deeper away from wickedness, deeper away from evil. And you begin to see it in your life because the Holy Spirit brings things up and you're like, I don't want any part of that. Right? So we have to understand that God is all of these things. He is both loving and a righteous judge. He is both kind and jealous of your attention. This is crucial to our understanding of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord holds to the fact that God is love, he is kind, he is compassionate, he is good, he is faithful, but he also hates evil. He's jealous of your attention. He stands for righteousness, and we read in in Psalm 5-4, it says he doesn't delight in wickedness. Listen to me very carefully. This is not condemnation or shame. This isn't about any of that. This is about we're drawing deeper into the Lord to understand that God does care about justice. God does care about displacing evil with good. God does care about these things. And he can be both loving and he can be a righteous judge. He's both. It's who he is. It's his character. There are consequences for evil. Sometimes I wish there weren't, (laughs) because that's an easier thing to say. But guess what? That's not going to bring transformation. All right. This is what love should propel us into. God is both love and just. He is both full of mercy and grace, and he's a righteous judge. So his heart is for good, not evil. That's important. His heart is for good and not evil. I'm not saying we don't make mistakes or that we do this perfectly, but I'm saying that what we choose does matter. And I think right now, I just need to hit this real quick. I think right now, the Lord is raising up a remnant that doesn't care about anything other than walking in the fear of the Lord. And I think this is part of it because we understand he's jealous for my time. He's jealous for my attention. He's a mighty warrior on my behalf. And I know that I'm going to give an account. And so even if I make a mistake, it's okay. It's okay. Let's turn to him. That's that's repentance. That's there's there's confession, and we turn to him. But the point is that when I'm faced with a decision, I'm faced with the fact that I know that the Lord does care what I choose in this aspect, and I'm going to choose him I remember one time I was um, doing some social media for a a particular client Um, I do some marketing it's kind of something I do on the side I've been doing it since 2017 and I had a particular client that I was I was running some social media for just posting on their page and there ended up being a conversation where they were starting to ask and say hey like can you promote some same-sex weddings? And like, can, can we start marketing this? Because we feel like we need to, we need to market this. Um, and again, please understand, I say this with all the love in my heart, okay? If you're struggling with identity in that area, just know that we love you and there's no judgment or condemnation in any way. But I do want you to just know, as a business owner, this was a really big struggle of mine. Because I was faced with the potential of 
money's coming in, business is here, but now there's an ethical decision based on what I believe, which is I believe that the Bible talks about marriage being between a man and a woman. Amen. So what I see in scripture, it's what I see, okay? No judgment, no condemnation, but this is what I find in here is that that is biblical marriage, okay? So I'm struggling with this. I remember calling several people. I think I called my dad and I was like, what do I do? Like, what do I do? Like, this is a really difficult decision as a business owner. And I remember the Lord just put it so hard on my heart. He was like, it's your business. So what do you want to do? And what do you want to value with your business? And so I remember, I was, I was so nervous, guys. I called up one of the board members for this business. And I was like, hey, this is what's going on. I'm going to be honest. This is a struggle of mine. So I bless you guys. If you guys continue down this path and you really want to market it, it puts a reflection on me because I do your marketing. And so because of that, if this is where you guys want to go, that's fine, that's great, but I am going to have to, I'm going to have to say, I'm going to have to stop doing social media for you. This is the conversation that I had legitimately. Well, this board member ends up calling other board members. They end up having a conversation, and because of my one phone call, they end up making a decision not to not to market and pursue that. Because the board ended up not all being in agreement over that. So what happened? God honored the decision to walk in a manner that was values with what he values and cares about. And I had to take some ownership as a business owner and say, this is what I stand for. And I just cannot stand for things that I do not believe and agree with that line up with this. And it ended up prompting a conversation that actually ended up with them going in a different direction. But all because of one phone call to say, this is where I'm going to put my flag in the sand. I'm drawing a line of demarcation in the sand, and because I fear God, I cannot in good judgment make that decision. I'm not saying that either to put any judgment, either a condemnation on any business owners in the room. I know it's difficult decisions, okay? I'm just telling you what, what one story that the Lord really gave me in this area. And so what I want to talk about real quick is that the fear of the Lord eliminates every other option. I saw a quote the other day that said, the church is not struggling for a lack of information, but of consecration. We're not struggling with information. We're not struggling with options. What we're struggling with is the ability to stay the course on one option. What does too many options do to your ability to choose one option? Have you ever thought about this? How many of you like movies? All right, I love movies. I'm a big movie person. My daughter got that after me. She loves movies too. And so we'll sit down, Emily and I, and we'll be like, hey, let's watch a movie. And then we get on, and we're looking for a movie, and, you know, it's 7 o'clock, and we finally are like, oh, okay. We choose one, and it's been an hour right? Anybody else here? Okay. Can we be honest? And then we're like, nah, let's just watch a TV show and go to bed. We took too long. But why did we take too long? Because on streaming platforms right now, there's 22,136 movies to choose from. So how do I choose one out of 22,136 on a given night and feel like I made a good choice and that I shouldn't have chosen the other one. Right? What about eating? Some of you, it's 12 o'clock almost. You're already thinking about lunch. I hear you. 
Did you know that there's 15,000 restaurants in the DFW Metroplex? Do you think you can choose just one right now? Online dating, five million active users. Try to find one person, right? Ah, that one hurt. If I go on Amazon right now and I search for toothbrush, <laughs> toothbrush, how, how hard is it to choose a toothbrush? There's 10,000 options. Oh my gosh, 10,000. I just want a toothbrush that cleans my teeth. And I have to wade through 10,000 options, right? There's been a lot of research done on this. Listen to this. This is actual like psychology research. Choice overload, they actually, kinda, they actually call it overchoice. Okay, overchoice is a cognitive impairment that occurs during a decision-making process when we are presented with too many options we cannot easily choose between. This is real, okay? Our ability to make a good decision is reduced by the overload of choices. Listen to this, though. This is the one that got me. It's not just that making a good decision is reduced. It's that your satisfaction is reduced. Research says that having too many choices actually decreases a, a person's ability to take action. Is that not real? It's why I spend an hour trying to pick a movie. It's why I end up defaulting to my favorite restaurant instead of picking a new one. It's just too darn hard. So what happens is, is in the world that we live in, the options only increase. There's only more toothbrush results. There's only more restaurants. There's only going to be more movies. There's only going to be more social media profiles. There's only going to be more social media platforms. There's only going to be more choices on, on what you should do here and how you should go there and what you should decide to do there. The options are going to increase, so we can't just say, hey, let's just wade through the options. It's that we have to just go down to one. Because the more options you have, the less satisfied you are with the result. It's why when I pick a movie, I think I should have chosen the other one after watching it for 15 minutes. It's why Emily and I started going away from streaming for a while, and we just chose DVDs. You want to know why? Because I have a finite selection. I only have 25 DVDs, not 22,000. Making a decision became easier. Did you know that walking in the fear of the Lord makes the decision easier? Oh, come on. What happens? It eliminates all other options. Wickedness. Nah, let's not watch that. Evil. Nah, let's not watch that. Why? Because my yes to the fear of the Lord means that about 17,438 of those choices I can't watch. Right? The one option eliminates all these other options. And you know what it does? Oh, it makes me a lot more satisfied. It reminds me of the story of the Israelites in Exodus 32. Moses goes up on the mountain, right? He's up there. And for the Israelites, he's up there too darn long. And it says what? Moses delayed coming down the mountain. So you can picture this. Moses is up on this mountain, and you're the Israelites, and you're like, man. Like, come on, Moses. We got to get going. We need a leader, and our leader is up on the mountain with God. So what happens? In seasons of delay, there's a temptation to disregard plan A and to go to plan B. So the Israelites decide, man, you know what? Hey, I got an idea. Let's do this. Let's create a golden calf. And this golden calf will lead us because we need a leader. And instead of 
waiting and allowing God's leadership and what God had already previously spoken to them to remain true and standing on that, they go, ah, plan B sounds better right now because we can take it into our own hands. What am I talking about? I'm talking about options. I'm talking about options. I think a lot of us, we, there's still about a 30% chance that we should choose plan B over what God said. And so we begin to choose other options. And we say, ah, plan B sounds good. Did you know that the Lord only wants you to have plan A, his plan? I'm not saying not to use wisdom. I'm just saying plan B for the Israelites looked like stepping outside of God's leadership and deciding to do it their own way. How often do we do this? Oh, it's taking God too long. Oh, that prophetic word I got five years ago hasn't, hasn't come to pass yet, so, nah. I don't really need to step into this. Uh, God said that a month ago, but... And we begin to make decisions not based on what God says, but because there's a season of waiting or a season of delay, there could be a temptation to pull ourselves out of what he said and to begin to go our own way. But the person that fears the Lord said, this is what God said. This is what he said. And I'm going to follow that with all, all I've got. When seasons of delay come where we have been waiting, we have to choose to follow what he has said. What's the point? Stick to the one thing. The fear of the Lord eliminates all other options. It makes it so you don't need a plan B. You don't need a plan C. It would have been easy for me to make a plan B with that business and say, oh, I'll just market these posts or I'll just do this. Instead, the Lord actually out of that season, listen to this, out of that season, I lost my biggest client after a while. Even though they had made that decision, they ended up wanting to part ways. And the Lord gave me the biggest client I've ever had in my life after that. Enough, like, almost four times the income. I think that following God's way brings more blessing, more favor, and more provision than you could ever ask for. Not because we're focused on the favor, not because we're focused on the provision, not because we're focused on the outcome, but because we've made him our one thing. And so when we make a decision and we make a phone call and we say, hey, this is how I'm going to have to do, God's like, hey, okay, thanks for choosing me. I'm going to give you the biggest client you've ever had in your life now, three months from now. He didn't tell me that. It just happened. Why? Because the fear of the Lord produces favor. Even if it may not be that you're liked by everyone, it produces godly favor because you're focused on him. All right, we're going to land the plane. This is the reality of Acts 9. The church increased, not because of messages about being blessed. The church didn't increase because they had more programs. The church didn't increase the fear of the Lord and the strengthening of the Holy Spirit. That brings increase. Walking with God in the fear of the Lord says there's only one option in the midst of many. This one option, obedience and being faithful to pursue him above all other things, will bring exponential things that you could have never imagined, but it's because you're so laser focused on the one thing. Does this make sense? Out of all the options in the world... We cannot allow options to creep into our decision-making all the time. We cannot allow options to creep into all this stuff. It's what is God saying? What is God saying? All right. If I could have keys, if you want to, you can go get your kids in just a little bit, bring them back in, but I'm going to land. The reality of the fear of the Lord and the church increased because the fear of the Lord will never let you live on the fence. And you know what, guys? Can I be honest? Can I, can I crush some stuff right now? 
we have been on the fence for too long. There has been a fence in the church that said it's okay to do these things. There's still blessing and all this stuff. There's okay to do this. And we've been okay with the fence. And God is saying, I am, we are called right now. I believe we are preparing the way of the Lord. John the Baptist was a forerunner in that he prepared the way of the Lord for Jesus to show up on the scene. I believe we're living in the days when we're preparing the way of the Lord for his return. And as we're drawing nearer to that time, it becomes more and more apparent that we cannot ride the fence. We cannot be half in and half out. It cannot be okay to choose this one day and then not okay when I'm in church. Oh, man. Guys, it's either hot or cold. It's either I am all in and I walk in the fear of the Lord. And this, this is a love thing. God loves you so much to draw you deeper into him and to say, hey, I, my heart is that you not choose anything but me. My heart is that you not have to ride the fence. My heart is not that you choose 17 other options. It's that you focus on the one. It's David's cry in Psalm 27 when he said, one thing I have asked. That shall I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord. David's cry was one thing. It's the one thing. What does that mean? It means that the fear of the Lord is the most expensive thing you can give your life for. Because it will not look like what the world says, acts, or thinks. It will pull you closer to him and away from other things. So here's the reality of this decision. The reality is Saul had an encounter. He parts ways with anything else that's not of the Lord. And he begins to immediately proclaim Christ. This is the line that the Lord, I believe, is drawing in the sand right now. Is that... The reason it's expensive is because the world will say things, act, and think, and we have to be like, no, that's not God. That is not God. What is God doing? He wants your life laid down. The fear of the Lord is to love what he loves. It's to hate what he hates. It's what's important to God is important to me. It places the desire in me that I cannot just be casual with my walk with the Lord. I have to take it seriously and to give myself to this walk. It's like Daniel who made a decision, I'm not even going to eat from the king's choicest food. I'm not going to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar. I'm not going to bow to other idols. It's Moses telling Pharaoh to let his people go. It's David killing Goliath, a little boy decides he can slay a giant when no one else wants any part of it. Why? Because David said, I fear God. God said he's given the Philistines into our hands. Why is no one agreeing with that word? Because the church gets afraid. And then we decide, no, we can't partner with that because of what might happen. What what are the consequences with that? Well, I can tell you the consequences with that. I would rather put up with that than I would to not be obedient to what God is saying. And he is saying, the Philistines, I have given the Philistines into your hands. Will someone agree with that word and partner with it? David says, pick me, the shepherd boy that that was killing lions and keeping watch over the the flock, he says, I will partner with that word. And all it took was a sling and a rock. It didn't take a sword. It didn't take a shield. It didn't take all of the stuff that we like to put on. It just takes partnering with the Lord. Faith looks like being anchored to what he says. This is how to walk in the fear of the Lord. It's that his voice is the loudest one you listen to. His way is the only way. It's the one thing. You're not always going to do it right. You won't always make the right choices, but you got to keep coming back. You got to keep coming back as David did. And he said, one thing, Lord, one thing, Lord, one thing, Lord, one thing, Lord. I made a mistake back there, but one thing. I turn back to you. I turn back and I say, one thing is you. Can we just stand The 
Lord really put this word on my heart, and although it's not the easiest one, the reality is that the days that we are living in don't call for passive Christianity. The days that we are living in don't call for fence Christianity. It doesn't call for culturally correct Christianity. The days that we are living in don't call for half in and half out. It doesn't call for more options. It doesn't call for, well, let's do plan E. Let's take the growth, church growth model, plan C. I'll give you one church growth model. Walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. That's the only church growth model that I'm subscribed to. I'm laser focused on him and he draws, he brings. It's not my job to, to fill this place. He will do it. And he already is doing it. But not because we're so focused on strategies, because we're up here for an hour saying you satisfy my heart every time when you walk in the room it's because we spend an hour doing that and we spend an hour worshiping him laser focused on him making decisions with him in mind focusing on him and when we do that things begin to happen increase comes the cities begin to have peace. Cities are transformed because we encountered him and we became an instrument of encounter. And we walked out there and we said, hey, there's a lion in the sand. Let me help you. Let me help you. Let me walk in the fear of the Lord. And you know what? Let me tell you something. People are not attracted to cultural Christianity. They may think they're attracted, but then they find out, oh, it doesn't actually change people. There's not transformation there. People are attracted to the fear of the Lord. Because when you make a decision that says, my life is anchored in the fear of the Lord, and you begin to align yourself with that, and you say, I can't do the fence. I can't do half in, half out. I can't do uh, cold sometimes and hot sometimes. The Lord brings things, and you begin to be set apart. Because the Lord isn't looking for more information. He's looking for more consecration. We don't need more choices. We just need to make sure we're choosing the right one, him. So I'm just gonna pray. Lord, I thank you that as a house that we are walking in the Acts 931. That is our church growth strategy. That is our, that is what we're after. We're after the fear of the Lord and the strengthening of the Holy Spirit. We thank you that our ability to walk in the fear of the Lord comes because your Holy Spirit is comforting us, exhorting us, strengthening us. And so I just, I ask you right now, Lord, we just draw a line in the sand and we say, we will stand for what you stand for. We will stand for purity when culture says, this is what it looks like. We're going to say, no, this is what it looks like. Because this is what God says, and this is what his word says. This is what truth is. I ask you that amidst all the other options, that we would choose the one thing. That we would listen to the one thing. That it's your voice that we are after. Lord, we just say that we will, we will love what you love. We will love people even when they're our, our, our enemies. We will love them even if they're betraying us. We will love what you love, but we will also hate what you hate, and we will also pursue justice. And we will say, let no wickedness be part of my choices. I choose to walk. The fear of the Lord is clean. It's pure. It's stepping into purity. And so, Lord, I release purity. We release walking in the fear of the Lord to a state that we say, there is no other option but pure, but holy before you. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord, but he who has clean hands and a pure heart. Lord, we ascend the hill of the Lord knowing that you've given us clean hands and a pure heart. So we step into that. May we walk in it. May our decisions look like it, Lord. And I ask you that you would raise up people that are willing to be loud in culture about this. That we would be loud to say the fear of the Lord is the only way. The fear of the Lord is the only way. 
It may look like I'm making a poor decision, but really I'm aligning myself with God and let Him bring the favor. Let Him bring the blessing. Let Him be the increase. Let Him bring provision. So Lord, would you anchor us deeper into the fear of the Lord? Would we be, would we be a church that we don't just read the book of Acts and we think, man, it's so cool what they did back then. But we think, let's read the book of Acts and go, oh Lord, what are you doing now? What are you doing now? We thank you for the healings now. We thank you for the Holy Spirit moving. We thank you that the Acts wasn't just written for then, it's written for now. But that you're raising up a people that are willing to say, we will only follow God. We will only follow Him. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I ask you that you would disrupt disorder in our lives. That you would eliminate disorder, Lord. Places that are out of order, out of divine order, which is centered on you. Lord, would you just disrupt that disorder and show us things we need to lay down. Show us areas we need to lay down. This is not a time, this is not a time to be passive, but a time to be actively engaging you. So we just ask you that you would allow us to walk in the fear of the Lord. We will be a church that walks in the fear of the Lord. We will be a people that walk in the fear of the Lord. Every moment we're in reverence and awe and we're trembling when you walk in the room. When you come into our car as we're driving that there's a trembling sense of God is here. The living God is with me. May we tremble in awe again, Lord. Would you bring back a a place of holiness? Would you bring back a better realization of the glory and the magnificence and the radiance of who you are? That we would tremble when you walk in the room. That we would, that we would, our hearts would leap. That there would be something inside that goes, oh, there's God. There's God in the midst of Starbucks. There's God in Walmart. There's God. Restore a tremble and a holiness, Lord. There's a return to holiness. There's a return to trembling. That we would tremble at your presence. That we would not just take it lightly. Thank you, Lord. I will give my life amidst all of the costs, Lord. Whatever it costs me to walk in the fear of the Lord, I'm willing to pay that price. Oh, hey. I'm willing to pay that price even if it may be, maybe it's going to hurt some business. Maybe it's going to hurt some choices that I've become really comfortable with. Maybe it's going to disrupt a few, a few plan B's and a few plan C's, but Lord, I choose to go after this expensive, costly thing because it's the only thing that satisfies. It's the only thing that brings true change. Culture's not going to change by us choosing all of the other options. Culture's going to change because we're so focused on the one. So Lord, I say that I will pay the price to do things differently than than the world does them. Even if it looks like there being a cost for my life, for my finances, to walk in that way, I choose to step over the line and say, I choose to walk in the fear of the Lord, whatever the price. I don't care. I don't care if they cancel me. I don't care if I have to take a little bit less business in order for the Lord to stand and do something to walk with him. I don't care. I choose to walk in this, Lord. And I'm just going to warn you guys right now, this decision is not one to take lightly. 
That prayer is not, it's not a light prayer. That's not a, hey, I'm just going to kind of pray this and things are going to be the same. That's a prayer that says, let the Lord direct my options. Let the Lord direct my path. This is the alabaster jar of perfume being poured out that was worth a year's worth of wages. This is all of the times that Peter and Paul and all the times they went to prison. This is all of the times that they were faced with with persecution. This is all of those times. But listen, the most, the best thing that you can do is to follow the Lord no matter what the price is. So Lord, we make that decision as a church. Even as we're talking about vision this month and with our team, we make the sole decision that you are our one thing. Convergence Church is yours. Would we be guided by the one thing? And I'm just telling you, watch what happens when you're guided by the one thing.